And you you mentioned uh, neo-colonialism. Uh, can you say more about that? What what is it for people who might have not heard? What what is neo-colonialism? Well, I mean, you, you have the traditional colonialism, and where a government went into another people's land and basically set up a base there so that they could take their resources. Um, but now that we've moved away from that, and you know, and, and countries have declared their own independence, uh, this neo-colonialism becomes a continuation of that. But now we control the economies, and instead of us physically being there, we're economically there. So that, um, you know, with partners of the elite within those countries, um, the, the resources and goods continue to flow to the center, which happens to be Wall Street. Right, right. And moving from, from that, uh, what, what do you say, would you say about the conflict between Israel and Palestine? Obviously, it's a very complicated issue right off the bat. Um, the Palestinians um, live, I mean, they, their land is occupied land. I mean, this is their land, and they have a, a, you know, with the settlements and the continuous the settlements, you have that. At the same time, Israel is a concern because missiles are being thrown onto their land, you know, where they happen to be. Um, I'm in favor of a two-state solution, um, but there's such a history there that individuals cannot speak to each other or don't speak to each other. Um, so, so I think the job of those of us who are people of faith, and not just Christians, but faithful Jews and faithful Muslims, and you know, is to to do the act of reconciliation. Hmm. Um, and, and I think that's what we bring to the table. Right, right. Um, so this this whole. Uh, um religious uh, uh, wars that we hear about and so that has to do also with differences right and in and, and multicultural differences and, and and churches have been talking a lot, a lot about multiculturalism what is your take on on that on that idea of multiculturalism yeah. multiculturalism has become a very popular term right now um, a buzzword that many people use um, especially to show that they're progressive and that they're hip um, I, I, you know, and don't get me wrong. I think multiculturalism is very important. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be moving that direction. I'm more concerned when we use that as a way to showing that look, we're okay because we're doing multiculturalism, when in fact we ignore the power relationships that continue to exist within cultures. In other words, it's one thing uh, to be the token; it's another thing to have a place at the table. And, you know, as, as a, a Latino scholar, many times I'm invited uh, to have positions of privilege within organizations only to find out that that was just an advanced form of tokenism, mm -hmm. that they really don't want my voice, they just want my Hispanicness in the room to show how progressive they are. So if we're talking about multiculturalism, I believe it occurs when the power structures are so diverse that those who are usually in power um, no longer are. Mm, right. But this is painful, right? No. For those in power to, to lose their, their, their position. No, no question about it. I mean, I think this is why we're seeing these kind of laws against Hispanics because I mean, if we keep looking at the numbers, uh, by 2050, his, you know, one out of every three people is going to be a Latino or Latina. Wow. Um, that's very, that's very scary to those who are used to being in power. You know, by 2050, white Anglo Americans will no longer be the majority. Right. So the question now becomes, how do we become a minority that still controls the majority of the power? Right. So you start seeing. A Supreme Court like we have now that is coming out with some very interesting rulings that ho that, 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 that reinforces the power within the hands of a very small um, very wealthy elite right right and and how do the churches uh, can respond to, to to that when when the churches are seeing that there is an uh, influx of, of, of so many people that they haven't seen, but they're scared, and but they sometimes wanted to help, uh, to to embrace, but do not know how. What? How do you think the church can can respond to that? 
many ways. I think I think some of the mistakes that the church makes is that they confuse charity with Christianity. Mm -hmm. In other words, they move to do charity, so they set up soup kitchens and they start giving away clothes and 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 help these poor unfortunate souls. And, and don't get me wrong, that's important. We should feed the hungry. We should clothe the naked. But that should be the bulk of the ministry. Mm -hmm. That should be to meet an, uh, an immediate necessity. I think what the church needs to realize is that um, if there's any power, it, you know, and I'm talking about the Christian church, if there's mm -hmm. any power, the power is with God and with Christ. Therefore, uh, to truly be a Christian, one must um, you know, stand before the cross of Jesus and nail their sins to the cross. And by sins, I'm talking about the power of, ra of race privilege, the power of gender privilege, the power of class privilege, the power of heterosexual privilege. That these sins need to also be nailed to the cross and therefore stand before the cross as a new creature. And if, if that truly happens, if, for example, myself, if I truly nail my, my sins of sexism to the cross, then the issue becomes how do you, I you now use my power of maleness to dismantle the very structures that privilege me because I am male? And in doing so, realize that I will no longer have the power to even do what I'm hoping to do. Right. And, and that's very scary because, quite frankly, most people like myself would like to hold on to that power. Right. It's nice to, you know, to have a seat at the table just because I happen to be a man. But then again, am I a Christian committed to the cause of justice, or is this nothing but a nice social club that I belong to? So that is what differentiates also the ways in which we can call it Christian ethics than ethics. Is that grounded in, in, in the cross? Is that For Christian it should be, um, mm -hmm. but, but I want to be careful because when I read the Quran, I, I see similar things in the Quran. You know, I, I, I see the Quran also calling for this type of justice. When, when, when I speak to my Buddhist brothers and sisters, I hear them saying similar things about achieving the higher consciousness of being nothing. And so, so I think many of the world's faiths and religions have a similar foundation. And I'm not, I'm not trying to centralize that we're all the same. We're not. I mean, I'm a Christian because I choose to be a follower of Christ. The question becomes is do I truly take that seriously as a Christian or you know do I just am I just a cultural Christian because that's what I grew up in and that's what you know uh, my culture happens to expound right and so as a Christian how then can we engage in, in uh, interreligious dialogue what I have always found in my, in my own experience is my job as the Christian is to make the Muslim the best Muslim they can be. Mm -hmm. and, to, and, and to help the Buddhists be as faithful to the teachings of Buddha. Because as we all, from different faith tradition, move towards justice, we're closer to each other than I am to other Christians who are more interested in the doctrines. Right. You know, I, I, I'm a strong believer in orthopraxis, correct um, action, than I am in orthodoxy, correct doctrine. Mm -hmm. So I find that, in, that I find that I have better conversation with those whose passion for justice based on their faith tradition is strong than I do with those who are more interested in, for example, is Jesus in the bread, around the bread, above the bread, under the bread. You know, it, 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 I, I could care less. Right, right. So, Looking at the world and what's going on uh, around the world in terms of libertarian movements, we can name Occupy Street, we can name, um, with some complications to the Arabic mm -hmm. Spring. So, what can you say about this movement? Yeah. My, my, my f you know, I think these movements, first of all, are great, they're excellent, but here's my biggest fear with them, and that is they could very easily and very quickly get co opted. You know, for example, the Tea Party was a movement, and you know they had some very important things that they needed to say. You know, concerning the rights of individuals, the rights of 
of society to make their own decisions, but they got they were very quickly co-opted um, by by um, certain groups that made them more into a political movement for a political party. Um, the same could happen with uh, the, the Wall Street um, Occupy movement. They could easily get co-opted, and they lose that energy of um, uh, 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 you know of, uh, 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 of riling against the establishment. You know, I think the Tea Party was just as angry against Wall Street and the shenanigans that went in and the Occupy movement, but one got very quickly co-opted, and that changed their you know their thrust. So I I, I think. Um, as these movements develop, we, we really have to be very careful as to where the money all of a sudden starts coming. Because, mm -hmm. you know, once money starts flowing in from certain quarters of society, um, we may find those movements becoming a political pawn in a much larger chess game. So, that, that, that's, those are my concerns. Right. And we kind of saw that in, we mentioned the Arab Spring, we kind of saw mm -hmm. that in Egypt in where, you know, this great, you know, revolution, all of a sudden you have the military um, kind of calling the shots at the end of the day. And, 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 and of course, you know, fortunately, people, you know, a lot of Egyptians are now pushing back on that. So there's a tremendous degree of power. You know, if, if Christians actually lived out the gospel message, mm. the whole world would be turned upside down. That's right. That's you know, right. I mean, I, I strongly believe that. Right. And where, what are, where are the, 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 the movements of liberation that you see happening, either in small scale or larger scale? Where, where you see the things are happening, or, or where should we uh, take our eyes to look at? Okay. I always say, if you want to see Jesus, mm -hmm. if you want to look into the face of Jesus, then come with me down to the border in Arizona and walk the trails with me, leaving water and food and medicine. And when you see that migrant walking on the trail, you have seen Jesus. Mm. Uh, for, you know, Jesus makes it very clear. When you feed the hungry, when you give water to the thirsty, when you clothe the naked, you do it unto me. Um, so those movements of liberation are occurring in the places where the greatest needs are, where the greatest suffering is going on. Um, you know, I was in Indonesia a few months ago, uh, a 90% Muslim country. And I partook in a uh, street protest. And it is there that I saw Jesus among my Muslims, friends and brothers and sisters. Because, you know, uh, specifically my Muslim um, gay friends, uh, brothers and sisters. Because that's where the need was. Those were the people who were being persecuted. Oh, I see. 